Amitabh, thank you so much for joining uh, for this conversation. We all have heard this is the most unprecedented times we are all living in. But I want to ask you from your lens, how do you see the prospects of Indian economy? Because the numbers that we are hearing is so abysmal and, and, and so depressing. What do you see as a stalwart, as a leader in the banking space? What's your view? So, uh, you know, just talking about a macro a little bit and then diving into banking post that. Yeah. So if you look at uh, where India was pre-COVID, we were anyway in a little bit of a, a jam. We had a you know economy which had been weakening for a couple of quarters. The growth of the economy had been falling regularly since the March 18 quarter. So it was almost, uh, you know, uh, two years of falling GDP growth. Slow fall, but there was a... Uh, fall, which is uh, happening. Now, yeah. financial at 21 growth forecasts have begun to cluster around a contraction of 4 to 5%. Uh, and the financial at 22 recovery is also dependent on number of factors, most importantly, how the infection spread peaks and how it dissipates and how much time it takes for the economy to kind of limp back to normalcy. We are talking about potentially a nominal or a loss on a uh, you know, on a nominal basis, a GDP income loss of more than 20 lakh crores. And that is not a small amount. Now, yeah. the government has obviously tried to infuse uh, fiscal stimulus, which has actually been um, quite limited if you really look at, uh, you know, what they have done. But we also have to understand and appreciate that the government itself is going to suffer as a result of lower tax. They can't do the divestments. There is a dividend shortfall. And, that it's, and if you add the central government and the state government, we are talking about a loss of 3 to 4% GDP uh, for the government itself in terms of, you know, what they will lose. So as a result, yes, obviously we are going through unprecedented, trying, tumultuous times. And if you look at the banking sector outlook, uh, if I kind of talk on the first, the deposit side, uh, there is liquidity surplus right now at any point in time, as of June 25th, I think the data shows that the banking system had more than 6 lakh crores uh, parked with RBI, which means that banks are flush with liquidity and they don't know what to do with it. But eventually, the surplus uh, will go away. We all know that because the financial savings are, are you know, there is a clear correlation to, uh, you know, to the GDP. And as GDP falls, the financial savings will fall. And yeah. we'll also see, you know, because of this, some of the schemes government has come out, the MSME schemes, some of the larger corporates as their working capital cycle comes back, will start kind of drawing down on their line. So some of the surplus will go away, which would mean that in the long run or in the kind of short to medium term, you will see deposit growth rate fall. Uh, and you will obviously see a clear polarization happen where some of the larger PSU banks and the and the well-known uh, private sector banks will benefit at the cost of some of the smaller private banks or the regional banks or the cooperative banks or even uh, you know, investments in NBFCs. So that is one thing. So deposit growth right now might look pretty okay, but I do expect it to go in the wrong direction. Uh, as far as NIM trajectory is concerned, uh, you know, the government and the RBI, but, you know, specifically has been cutting rates quite aggressively and they have linked the uh, cuts to the repo rate, which might not necessarily reflect the cost of deposits of the bank. Uh, and obviously all of us are committed to kind of passing it on. But on the other side, you're also, you're not able to deploy the extra deposits which the banking system is getting and you're parking it uh, with RBI at lower rates. So uh, in the short run, uh, you might see some compression of RIMS, but overall the NIMS in the industry will depend on what the capital allocation decisions are, ultimately what the cost of, where do the cost of deposits kind of end up, how does the economic environment shapes up, and obviously how much of excess capital the banks have. Uh, yeah. As far as cost structure is concerned, all of us, everyone, I think will look at how they can cut costs. It's a new environment, new way of working. So people are re-looking at the real estate requirements. People are re-looking whether they need that many people. People are re-looking at what kind of people they need. Can we increase the spans? Uh, are, people are looking at you know the number of branches, the location, all of that. And uh, obviously the idea there is that you want to reduce your costs as much as possible. So you might see a compression or at least uh, a fall in the growth rate of costs quite significantly in the system. Uh, competitive intensity will come down. On one side, you have NBFCs, mutual funds, which were large providers of capital to the financial system. They are struggling uh, while the liquidity might be okay now, but the ability to grow will get hampered. So again, yeah. it will speak to the larger institutions. Uh, customer profile will change in a big way uh, because, you know, firstly, the customer's expectations have changed. They've got to a new way of working. A lot of the customers, actually the customers people want are 
you know, getting used to working from home, staying at home. Uh, so it does create an opportunity to identify segments of customers who require credit, segment of customers who require different kind of service, a different kind of approach in terms of accessing them and accessing their investments. Uh, obviously, the fintech uh, segment or what you can do with technology will play a very important role going forward. And with all that is happening, you will also see, uh, you know, the regulatory oversight increase. I mean, uh, the government has allowed. Uh, they initially rolled in the uh, housing companies under RBI, and now they rolled in the cooperative banks. The governor has been quite vocal about how they will uh, use this time to actually ensure that they don't have repetition of the kind of crisis you have seen on the NBFC side or the cooperative bank side, or even some of the private bank side. So you will see regulatory oversight go up. Uh, it will become more intensive. It will become more insightful. Uh, they will obviously push the banks on a regular basis to ensure. Uh, that we do not have a repeat of anything that has happened in the past. So yeah. uh, interesting times ahead. Uh, I think the big will benefit at the small, at the cost of the smaller ones, and it also will allow an opportunity to uh, the institutions who can execute well, who can capitalize on opportunities, to come out ahead uh, in a crisis like this because this crisis will last for a long time. So sorry, a long answer to a short question, but. I thought, let me just set the context. I was speaking recently to the finance minister. We interviewed her and, and, and uh, uh, she was talking about all the stimulus, the packages and everything that she's doing for the MSME sector, you know, for the different sectors. And one of the things that she was talking about is that how the whole focus is that the revival should be very inclusive. If India has to really accelerate the revival, what are some of the things if you had to, you know, suggest we should do? You know, please let's understand that the government's hands are also kind of tied uh, behind the back to some extent. While they have, uh, you know, been uh, very, very vocal about the fact that they will support and provide whatever support is needed, end of the day, our ratings have been cut and government has to be cognizant of the fact that yeah. you can't just keep writing large checks. The government has talked about a 20 lakh crore, uh, you know, uh, package. Uh, to help, uh, you know, the various sections of the society. But if you look at uh, what, the, what the approach of the government has been, they have done it quite smartly. They are basically asking everyone to bear the, uh, the burden of this crisis to some extent. Government is saying, I will bear the burden and I will support you in some form or shape. By the way, the banking system, you need to bear the burden. So in some cases, you know, we have some of our uh, you know, services are being provided for free in many, and we have given the moratorium. Now there is an increasing talk of the fact that they might allow a one-time restructuring uh, for at least certain sectors of the economy. They have RBI has stepped in to ensure that enough liquidity is provided in the system. And, uh, and they have also kind of provided some very specific support in terms of refinance lines. And somewhere they're also asking the companies to share the burden and somewhere even the consumer to share the burden. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, people are going through salary cuts. Some people might go through actually job losses. They might have to mm -hmm. go and change their jobs. Some people might have to shift locations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think, uh, firstly, the government and uh, the the powers that be are saying, you know, its crisis is large enough and significant enough and will long uh, for a long period of time. And it can't the burden can't be borne by just one entity here or one. Yeah. Here. It has to be spread, and the government has been spreading it. And I think that's yeah. why when the finance minister says that it has to be inclusive, we have to take care of the sections of the society which are going to suffer the most. Uh, I, I think she's obviously saying absolutely the right thing. Now, government, if you look at the interventions where cash is involved, where yeah. government has actually put in money, I yeah. think almost all the interventions have gone to the sections of the society which need the money today. Yeah. Uh, even when government is talking about a guarantee scheme for, say, MSME, I mean, that will pan out and play out over the next three to four years. Government yeah. doesn't have to write a check today. They're just giving a guarantee. So I think the immediate interventions have been all about uh, actually giving money to the section society where it is required. Uh, obviously, as you know, various state governments, uh, you know, the uh, people at the district level, at the uh, city's level, all the companies, institutions, both public and private, are stepping up in whatever shape and form to support the a government and the government instrumentalities of the government, it could be district, it could be, you know, a city, whatever that might be, and, you know, provide that support that might be necessary to ensure that the society at large or the people who cannot afford it uh, don't suffer. Uh, yeah. The good news is that the while the India has not been able to flatten the curve, as they say, I think maybe it has been able to, uh, you know, at least reduce the slope of the line. And uh, the number of mortality rates in India seem to be lower. I think over the last... 
as this infection has spread globally, I think it appears that the protocols which the hospitals have to maintain to manage uh, infection of this nature for a patient, depending on how severe it is, seems to have settled down. So I think lesser and lesser number of people are dying. And the, there is an increasing realization that for most of the patients, hospitalization itself might not be required. So, I mean, now, earlier people were talking about ventilators. Now people are talking about the fact that we have enough hospital beds. Now people are talking about do we have enough quarantine centers. Uh, so it looks like if we can, if people are, uh, you know, behave in a trustworthy manner and maintain the guidelines and the distancing, which everyone is asking them to do, uh, the infection can be contained. Uh, hopefully it can be brought down and the mortality rates can be kept low, and so the economy can gradually come back to normalcy, and that's why we have unlocked two before us. The only problem which I see today is that it is still fits and starts. It is start, stop, start, stop, which is quite visible across various cities in India. Uh, for example, you know, uh, the greater metropolitan region of Mumbai is going through a 10-day shutdown. Chennai is just coming out of a shutdown. Uh, they're talking about a shutdown in you know, Telangana. Uh, you know, the, the West Bengal government has written to the center that please don't allow flights from these particular cities, and so on and so forth. So I think the people are being, uh, have generally been well taken care of. Yes, there was a crisis and the migrants started moving. I think the, the size and the speed at which that happened maybe was not anticipated. But now you're seeing the reverse flow happen. And as I talk to the various businesses, they are saying that they should be able to start in the next 30 to 60 days. But yes, it will be slow and a gradual process. And it will have this fit and starts continue to happen for some period of time because if the infections spike up, government will have no choice but to clamp down. And clamping down would mean shutting down you know, various parts of the cities or, or districts or whatever that might be. You know, you have been in the industry for the last 30 years and, you, and you know, you've you know, we've seen lots of crises. What are some of the learnings? What are some of the observations? What are some of the things that we as people, leaders across sectors can pick up from this so that we operate more effectively? So I remember, you know, when I had done some media interview in I think February of uh, this year. And at that time, uh, I had made the statement that I think we are underestimating the uh, the damage this crisis can cause because at that time the news was coming out of China and and believe me I I completely underestimated it even though I made the statement uh, because I had never in my dreams thought that we'll be in a lockdown by March end. Uh, so one thing is that I think uh, like technology we tend to underestimate uh, at times what the crisis can do uh, and we also tend to underestimate how willing uh, the a society is and the people and the employees are when the change is required. Uh, we understand, underestimate that too. So firstly, the crisis has been unprecedented. People are talking about it as a black swan event and I completely agree. Uh, I think uh, this is a message from nature that uh, we have played enough with them. Uh, but we also have been positively surprised by how well the society at large and the employees, I mean, you know, have responded to this crisis, how quickly they have changed their behavior, how quickly they have adopted to new ways of working, how quickly they have embraced technology wherever required. And that applies to the customers also. I think because once they know that this is reality, I think all of us change very, very quickly. Uh, now we are, all of us are asking ourselves the question uh, that, you know, do we need to come to office every day? While if that was a question you had raised uh, in February, mm -hmm. uh, you, it, you, it would have been a career limiting question to ask. Uh, and, and so the adoptability uh, has been quite surprising. Uh, third is that I think uh, people tend to get uh, extremely worried and concerned with, you know, what is happening to them at point in time. And they do not apply. Uh, I think once you accept reality and then you start focusing on what needs to be done to manage that reality, I think certainly a lot of solutions appear. Just to give you an example in case of access, before the crisis, there are about only 400 people who could access access bank applications outside of access bank in the sense that you could access it from home and you could access about 11 applications. In a matter of a month, we moved to more than 10,000 people who could access access bank applications sitting from home and the number of applications moved to 485. Today, we have 75,000 people on Teams. At any day-to-day, uh, -day, about eight to 9,000 people logging to our applications. And our customer service has not suffered because of technology limitations. It might have suffered because, uh, you know, some people have not been able to come to work and and the face-to-face -face interaction has not happened or we've not been able to collect documents, et cetera, et cetera. So one is that, that 
you know, we need to we we need to focus on managing what is in front of us and the variables we can manage rather than uh, you know uh, creating a hue and cry about all the things that have been happening around us, which is frankly not in our control. Point number four is that I think in each of these crises, there is always an opportunity. And I'm not talking about opportunity just for the sake of it. I think opportunity to change your business model, opportunity to relook at everything what you have done in the past. Yeah. And ask ourselves the key question, do you need to do it differently going forward? And uh, I think the faster you embrace it and the faster you go after it, the more of the benefits you will get. Also new business models emerge and whether you can capitalize on them. Uh, and I think crisis like this also shows you, especially in a financial system, the value of trust, the value, how much uh, trust people, uh, you know, uh, faith and trust people repose on you. Because if that's what they do, the, the people tend to migrate to businesses, uh, uh, you know, and companies and institutions whom they can trust. Yeah. And if you are one of them, you without doing anything, because you have worked uh, so hard to create that trust, you yeah. get that benefit. So, you know, if yeah. you happen to be in that category, uh, you, you suddenly start looking very, very good. And all the hard work which you've done to create that will kind of comes to pay and pays for itself very, very quickly. So yeah, you, uh, these crises teach you a lot. By the way, this crisis is not over. Uh, we still have a lot to learn. Uh, and uh, we'll continue to learn as we move forward. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's the question. For example, we uh, I, I, I joined Access in November of 2018 and we have a management committee in place. The management committee has never talked as much as what they've talked in the last, uh, you know, 90 days. Uh, uh, I think we, we used to talk every day. Now we have kind of reduced it a little bit, but still we are talking very, very rarely for a long period of time. Uh, and I think it has uh, brought the whole team together and uh, allowed us to respond faster to the, uh, you know, the, the constantly changing uh, scenario in COVID. Today we are living in a world where, you know, banking as we know and what we have known is changing. And then there is this whole evolution and, you know, limelight center stage taking, if I may say so, of fintech and fintech startups, fintech companies. And there are so many new models coming be it from, you know, lendings to insurance to uh, uh, neo banks, you name it. And there are different, different uh, uh, kind of innovations happening. Uh, I want to understand from you, how do you see the role of banks? in the coming years and how do you see you you know you've been in this space you're leading in this space how do you see the role evolving of the so bank? one is that you know when uh, institutions become large in any industry like a lot of us are are very very large institutions and we provide the kind of the foundation for the financial system i mean we are one of them there are a lot of uh, players like us uh, your ability to innovate at the edge or your ability sometimes to come out with uh, new models which can actually disrupt what you do uh, does get inhibited because I think our thinking becomes incremental. We just keep changing things at the edge and make them incrementally better than actually disrupting ourselves. And fintech is one such revolution which actually comes and completely rethinks the model and, and finds new ways of doing things which obviously are way better than how, what the existing players in any industry might be providing. And, uh, and by the way, this is not a new phenomenon. This will continue to happen in the future. Today, they're called fintechs. Tomorrow, they might come out with some other name as artificial intelligence and machine learning and some of those things come. It will only get better and better. So on one side, you have to see them as competition and you have to be wary of them and you have to uh, you know, be in touch with them to understand and appreciate what they are doing and how you can collaborate and maybe partner with them so that you can bring a, bring a even better value proposition to the customer. Secondly, yes, as an institution, you don't want to become irrelevant. You have to ask yourself as to how do you create mechanisms and structures and frameworks to disrupt yourself. Because if you yeah. don't, and you only want to believe in partnerships, then some, some day might come where you will get eaten for lunch uh, by some of these fintechs. And if you go and talk to the fintechs, especially people who are doing well, they will actually tell you, uh, you know, when, mm-hmm. uh, when, when they are uh, feeling more friendly, that they will eat you up. One day. <laughs> so, so uh, and, and that's what the vision and that's what they really very passionately believe in. Because if they don't, then the whole model does go for a toss because the kind of value they get so quickly means that actually they're going to disrupt us. So the second part is that yes, you have to find ways to disrupt yourself. And because we are large institutions, our ability to invest is obviously infinitely more than some of the fintechs. Now, some of the fintechs are very uh, well supported. So I'm talking about as a general comment. Not as yeah. a fight and yeah. but uh, so we can invest. We can find 
uh, those set of people who can actually come and disrupt our business. And for example, in Access, we did set up a digital bank. The idea there was to disrupt ourselves, and we set it up almost a year back, and we are seeing the results of it come through. I was recently doing a review, and I told them the same thing. How much time are you spending on doing things incrementally today, though you've been with us for one year? And how much time are you spending actually to say that you will actually completely change the way Access Bank works? And if the number is you know, less than 50%, then I have a problem with you because that means you're not spending enough time on actually disrupting Access Bank. Uh, but that, you know, j just to give you a sense for how we are trying to push that agenda. Uh, my view is that frankly, COVID crisis hurts them more than us because in many cases, their models are under question. Uh, because what does a FinTech do? For them to get the right valuation, uh, they need to first come and attack that part of the business, which is juicy, which can give them good returns, which can actually create a customer proposition, which is very, very visible. Yeah. And I think a lot of the fintechs were attacking uh, the, uh, you know, the loan side, especially the unsecured loan side, for example. Now, who do you give a loan to? Because now they go very quickly, even though they just started a couple of years back, they are going to go through a retail cycle where they need to collect money. And uh, it might become very, very difficult. Getting funding for you know, giving those kind of loans might become difficult. I mean, the whole market has got disrupted in a very, very big way. So they have a problem of the existential kind today rather than actually looking at disrupting us. But, you know, talking more medium and long term, I think you have to embrace them. You have to understand them. You have to be with them. And then you have to create frameworks to continue to get disrupted yourself. I think all have to work. All are important uh, because you cannot get uh, generate all the ideas on your own. And there will always be some fintechs who will take away part of your business, you just then need to also ensure that you're attacking your costs in such a way that at least from a overall proposition perspective, you can compete with them. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't even have to happen through a fintech. If you look at the payment industry in India, I think here the regulator has played a very important role and a very you know positive role in actually bringing down the payment costs in India to almost zero. And yeah. I, I would you know, credit RBI for doing that. So payment business, which was, I think, a profitable business for a lot of the banks, today we just provide the pipes but most, like, for example, what we do in UPI or RTGS, all that does not pay for anything. It's all free for customers, which is very good for the customers. But at the end of the day, it's no longer a revenue generating business for you. It's just a service you provide. What are two, three things that you will say that we have to do, we have to accelerate, we have to pedal to get our economy fast track to, you know, getting into the numbers that we had? It's, it's a very, very important question because from, if you really think through uh, what we are going through, what the government needs to do. So for my view is, obviously, first, the government needs to bring the economy back. And that means unlocking and at the same time manage the, uh, the infection or let's say the management of the pandemic itself from a health perspective. So this balance between lives and livelihoods, that important role the government and the, both the center and the state have to play to ensure that uh, on one side, we're protecting lives or on the other side, we are gradually, slowly opening up the economy so that more and more uh, you know, parts of the economy open up and we come back to the growth rates from a, a pre-COVID perspective. Yeah. If we can't get that done, then, you know, all the dreams we have had will only get delayed rather than anything else. So that's that's one very, very important point. Uh, second is that uh, government does need to support during this crisis uh, certain sections of the society, certain uh, parts of the economy, uh, and, and because if they don't do that, the for the economy to come back could take a much longer time. So from our perspective, at least from my perspective, I do believe that government has already announced the support to the weaker sections of the society. Uh, the Prime Minister announced that uh, yesterday. Uh, I think the government will have to support certain sectors of the economy, especially the hotel, the travel industry, the hospitality industry, maybe even yeah. the real estate, the airlines, so on and so forth. And there are some very specific industries which do need to be supported in some form or shape, either directly or indirectly, because if that does not happen, then uh, we will have a problem. Um, I think... Uh, the third thing which the government needs to do is that uh, we are uh, faced with a, a unique opportunity where uh, given what is happening on a geopolitical basis, the supply chains uh, will uh, uh, be changed or altered or global companies will look at alternative sources of supply uh, and try to reduce the risk on a country or a supplier. And India has uh, potentially an opportunity to capitalize on that. Now, the problem is that uh, we don't score very well in ease of doing business. But whatever we can do to make India a destination to attract that, uh, that kind of uh, flow which could potentially come to us would obviously help the economy in the longer run. Fourth, India will need huge amounts of capital. 
If we need to get the growth back, the economy back, uh, we need to infuse capital across uh, the financial yeah. system and other parts of the economy. So whatever we can do to attract that capital, uh, and most of the capital will come from abroad, uh, we need to do that. And obviously, there are a lot of uh, private equity players who are already, you know, in, already investing and talking about investing in India. There are a lot of other foreign players who are talking about, uh, you know, uh, are very happy to invest in India. So what can we do to attract that capital? Uh, forget about, you know, um, you know, I'm talking about the geopolitical situation, but just attracting more capital, I think, is very, very important. You, yeah. you named the last point that, you know, India has 1.3 billion people. Uh, India has a lot of uh, key advantages for a lot of the businesses. This is the next frontier, which is the untapped frontier. And uh, what we can do to ensure that this untapped frontier is, uh, is, is tapped into so that it can obviously support the uh, growth of the country and growth of the people in whatever form and shape is again something which the government needs to look at. From a financial system perspective, uh, this is a perfect time to continue to show up uh, uh, while COVID crisis will cause uh, uh, more losses, more uh, uh, you know, non-performing loans. In my view, it will also give a unique opportunity to the larger institutions to continue to uh, show up their balance sheet to continue to show up their, uh, you know, how they do business and how, how much they invest in technology uh, to look at new ways of working so that once this crisis is over, we, we come out stronger through this crisis. So from my perspective, uh, I you know it almost might sound as if the government has to do everything. By government, I mean the center, the state and the uh, local. Yeah. Companies. And I think if they do that, automatically the, the corporate side and the society at large and the employees will respond. Because they need that cover of uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, changes to happen, and once if once these changes are to take place, I think the the rest of the uh, people yeah. who play a role in the economy will automatically respond. Yes. For all the young people, entrepreneurs, and everyone who will be watching this, if you if they had to uh, know from your journey, from your journey to the to the place that you are in, you know, if you have to look at and say that hey, these are some of the things I've done right in my career. And these are some of the things, the learnings that I have taken in my career and share it with us very generously. What would those be? So one is, uh, you know, nothing can take away hard work. Um, you have to work hard all your life. There is no magic mm -hmm. bullet here. Uh, you have to work hard consistently, constantly, all the time. Second is you need to be, you know, because we spend, uh, as I keep telling people, 70 to 75% of our waking hours in an office or or working on a career, it is very, very important that you enjoy what you do. You should be passionate about what you do and that you should bring every day uh, to work and every transaction, every interaction, because if that passion is not visible, uh, the people around you, uh, you know, it, it motivates the people around you, the teams around you, and it keeps you and makes you do things which, uh, you know, you would normally not do. Yeah. Uh, third for me is uh, learnability. Uh, I think all of us need to realize, and by the way, this crisis is teaching us that, you need to be on the lookout to learn every day. The junior most employees and interaction on the street can teach you something on customer service or how the customers are looking at your products or how things can be changed or how things are not working. And as long as you have an open mind and you're willing to learn and change, I think you will continue to remain relevant uh, in terms of what you're doing. Uh, uh, you know, I can go on and on, but... Uh, the other lesson which I've, I've been lucky to some extent, I've had great bosses. I somehow, somewhere, God has been extremely kind to me and, and I've had great mentors uh, in my career, throughout my career, somehow, somewhere. And um, I'm in touch with almost all my bosses even now and I have quite a few of them. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, obviously they've been great mentors, but, uh, you know, not only them, but, you know, when you look at seniors around you, uh, you, it's not that everyone is perfect, but everyone has some qualities which... Uh, you, if you look at yourself, you can work on. And I have tried to do that. I've tried to look around and always try to learn from why did that thing go well and what exactly was done there which made it go well. Um, uh, and, and try to kind of obviously pick that up and try to change myself, maybe not change myself enough, uh, but you need to do that. Uh, last but not the least, aim for the best, aim for the best benchmark unless you have the aspiration and the desire to be the best and set those aspirational goals, uh, you will only do things incrementally and you will always be an incremental player. Uh, I think aspiration and ambition makes you do things very, very differently. And that's where you can break through. 
and break out. And unless you break through and break out, uh, yeah, you know, you uh, you can do well, but you might not reach the levels which people you know want to and aspire to reach. What's your big aspiration and ambition when it comes to Access Bank? So I had said uh, when I joined Access that uh, I've not joined Access for Access to remain a uh, number three private, uh, private uh, you know bank player. I do want Access to move up the ranks, and you know, the rank is not in terms of size. I think for me, if, if I was to capture it in one word, it is. You know, when people look at banks, is Axis Bank respected? So in terms mm. of respect, and respect in it itself encapsulates a number of, you know, you have to be large, you have to be trusted, you have to do well, you have to be profitable, you have to have the right ROE. So I think respect brings a lot of uh, matrices inside it. Uh, so I do want to move the needle as far as Axis Bank is concerned in terms of how well it is respected in the financial system. And hopefully that will get reflected in how investors and our customers and our shareholders uh, uh, view us. Uh, it's a long journey. It's not going to be an easy journey because we have formidable competition. And by the way, people who are behind us are also not sitting and uh, <laughs> yeah. maxing. they're also trying to, I'm sure, displace us. So uh, it's, it's a tough journey. But I think unless we, as I said, aspire and set a, a difficult goal, uh, we'll not enjoy that journey. So we are on that journey. COVID crisis has only made it more complicated and more interesting. Uh, but I do believe that uh, in the last at least uh, uh, 18 months since I've taken over, we have taken a lot of right steps. Uh, you know, everything has not gone as well as you think or one wants, but it's okay. We are on that path. And I think if you keep doing the things that you are doing and we keep doing the right things and keep taking the right steps, the output will come. So I, that's what I, I encourage my people to think. I said, don't worry about, you know, what is happening in the short term. If you believe we are doing the right things and we keep doing them, you know, God will be kind to us one day. So it will happen.